And viva Los Angelitos, and welcome to this special episode of Halos in the Infield. My name is Fernando Mendez, taking the reins today, joined here by our friend over at Catella Chronicles, Dominic Lorenz. Dominic, how are you? Good, buddy. How are we doing? Uh, it's always awkward pretending like we haven't been talking for 15 minutes before I hit record. But uh, <laughs> exactly, we are right? <laughs> <laughs> we're joined here by a, a past guest. Uh, he is very big in the baseball community. Many of our fans were excited to hear he was coming back on. Urinating Tree. Mr. Tree, how's it going? I'm doing all right, man. Uh, nice night in Pittsburgh right now. Rainy, miserable, but it's going to hit 70 degrees. So fingers crossed. And that's hey, going to go back to 32. I'm in Chicago, and uh, we're getting the it's same cold. weather over here right now. So I'm You got Cal- ice on Wednesday. so <laughs> I'm in California, and we're having a winter storm morning. It's going to be like in the low 50s and raining for four days straight. Oh, no, the low 50s? The low yeah, 50s. Low fi- Bust out the umbrellas, so the winter coats. I'm so sad. <laughs> low 50s. It yeah. may Fear. hit up. We it may hit the upper forties. Upper forties. Breaking news. Oh no! Yeah, oh, I know. No. That was our high today. So yeah. Yeah, I was about the same here. I yeah. think it like hit like twenty eight at some point over here, and you know the windy city, obviously. So right off of Lake Erie is where oh, I was working. You got that brisk wind too. That's oh. the worst. Have you been at Wrigley before, Tree? I have. I was in Chicago a couple of years ago. Uh, so uh, two thousand nineteen, I was a. Uh, at the White Sox uh, ballpark, I wasn't a fan of that. Wrigley had that really? old charm. I was up in Milwaukee. I really liked that city. Underrated baseball stadium. Ever, whenever people talk about like the best stadiums in baseball, Miller they disrespect park. Milwaukee. Beautiful yeah. ballpark. Uh, uh, the problem is like it's hard to showcase its beauty on TV angles because most of it's that's like true. it doesn't look good on TV. <laughs> yeah, that's the yeah. problem. If you actually yeah. go in the stadium, it's beautiful. Yeah, I mean, you know, you, you PNC. Petco, Chorus mm-hmm. Field, you've got the backgrounds. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? You got the cityscape in both San Diego and Pittsburgh. You know, Colorado, you got the mountains in the city. Yeah, you don't get that with Milwaukee because of the walls. But like you said, man, walking around, the architecture is cool. The feel of the stadium how it has that like German kind of feel mm-hmm. and you know, the German boots. It's awesome. Did you do the Bud Sealing experience there? I did not, no. Oh, that was really well, that was- what happened was my car got totaled, so we had to rush it, and then we ended up getting there like the second inning. Tickets were really cheap, though, so it was a good experience. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think they I played the Reds in, in that series. Okay, yeah, I was there when they were playing, I believe, the White Sox and uh, Telez. Is that his name? Played a couple Roddy years Tellez. ago. Yeah, yeah, he hit a grand slam. That was interesting. At least I got to see the uh, the Brewer go down the slide. Mm-hmm. That was that's all I wanted. That's all I oh, wanted yeah. to see. I, I think I did see that too. I forget who had a homer there. I think it was like one or two. Or you yeah. can go down the Brewers slide and be like that Dodgers broadcaster who went down in a hot second and ends up busting his wrist because he didn't know how to <laughs> properly cement himself at the end of the slide. Like, come on now. Mm, it's been a while since you've been on a slide, dude. So you just got to plant your feet. <laughs> so you do it. I don't like going on slides. It shocks your bosoms. <laughs> well, you're not used to it because most of us haven't been on a slide in 25, 30 years, maybe 20 yeah, years. Right. Yeah. That's fair. That's fair. That's Dominic goes fair. on slides every other day. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, got a, I, got, I got a little play pen in the backyard. I have it every other day. That's my yeah, workout. Yeah. That's the workout. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. <laughs> so why do we bring your dating tree back on? Aside from the fact that you know uh, he's big in the YouTube community, uh, he's fun to talk baseball with. Now he's a Pittsburgh Pirates fan, so we're going to talk a little bit about just baseball in general. Spring training games are about to kick off here. So let's real quick start off with uh, the the biggest thing that happened for the Pirates this year, them deciding to bring Andrew McCutcheon back. So how excited were you to bring the hometown hero home? And, uh, you know, it's pretty set in stone that he's going to hit his 2000s hit this year. You know, bearing anything bad happening, knock on wood, I'm really hoping for him. Yeah, I think the main thing is, like, this is like a final going home tour. We had a spot open in left field because – I mean, Ben Gamble was okay, but he was like, you know, a placeholder. There have been some questions about Brian Reynolds' future. Like he demanded a trade, but at the same time, there is apparently like a big difference between what he wants an extension and what anyone else wants. Nothing's really moved on that front. G-Man Choi's had a bit of a beef with the team because they wouldn't let him play in the World Baseball Classic because they wanted him to recover from surgery. But Andrew McCutcheon, I mean... It's like that last relic to the last time the Pirates were good. Like the three years they were good at that I've known them exist. But uh, I mean, I would say like it's the comp is like Cam Newton with the Panthers in 2021. Like you're not going to get the same guy. He was there, but at the same time, it's good for the feels. He could still do a job. He's still serviceable. But at the same time, I mean, he's there to put butts in seats. 
Well, I mean, look at what happened this year with uh, Andrew uh, Andrew Pujols, Albert Pujols. Mm-hmm. I mean, Albert Pujols was playing like vintage Albert near the yes. tail end of the season. Man, mm-hmm. that was magical. Yeah, I um, I, I I expected the Cardinals to make the World Series that year just because of like all the BS happening. I mean, you have two MVP caliber performances in Goldschmidt and Arenado, Albert Pujols sitting bombs like it's 2006 against the yeah. Pirates usually because <laughs> he would destroy that team. Yeah. And then you have – He would destroy every pitches. team in all Yeah, fairness. but to be fair, <laughs> the Pirates were really bad in that time, so they served up a lot of meatballs to Albert Pujols. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, you know, and he was seeing them, you know, arguably more than he was seeing every other team, right, because, you know, mm-hmm. the in-division play. So did you hate Albert Pujols growing up because of that No, reason? not really. I mean, I just – I wish right. for Albert Pujols on my team. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. That was always like me, uh, you know, being an angel, being an Angels fan, you never really had to deal with him. But growing up in San Diego, my dad being a Padres fan, always dragging us to Padres games instead of Angels games. You know, uh, I would see Albert Pujols come and my dad would always make it a point. We're going to go watch Albert Pujols play. And man, oh man, back then, was it magical watching him swing a bat? Oh, Pujols, he would destroy baseballs, man. I mean, he was probably, you could argue, the best player of the 2000s just because He's- of the sheer just – ability to hit he just had freak power like he could hit yeah i, I think had, it all he had easy power easy contact swing mm-hmm. that's you know for the early 2000s before all the new technology and launch angle and exit velocity and all that good stuff just Absolutely. that simple back to ball albert Pujols mm-hmm. was the man mm-hmm. I, we're all roughly the same age i i would say that he's probably the best player that our generation has seen from beginning to end. Now, will that change? Absolutely. At some point, of course, I I mean, believing you can make the argument for Mike Trout. Yeah, but we haven't seen the full end of Mike Trout yet. Yeah. You know, and and with his injuries lately, you know, once again, knock on wood, let's hope that he's able to work through that. Cause that's the one thing about Albert Pujols. That guy was super durable for the first 15 years of his career. And even the tail end when he wasn't productive with the Angels anymore, he was still in the lineup 80% Mm -hmm. of the time. Yeah. Yeah. He battled and through what, injuries and, and a bunch of other different things. So you got to give him props for that at the end of the day, even though he wasn't 100% the Albert Pujols we all know and love if he was Cardinals or Angels or whatever. But he was still in the lineup better than Anthony Rendon lately. No, well, Rendon can't stay on the field. <laughs> That's the problem. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. So real quick, going back to the Andrew McCutcheon situation. So when his career is all said and done, you know, by then, like I said, it's safe to assume he's what, 52 hits away? I think so, close to it. Yeah, it's something like that. So, I mean, he he should have no problem getting that done in in theory. Once again, bearing injury Mm -hmm. mid-May. Um. How are you, as a Pirates fan, going to remember Andrew McCutcheon? Uh, is he on the Mount Rushmore of Pirates for you? No, unfortunately not. I mean, if you're okay. looking at the Mount Rushmore of Pirates, you're looking at Clemente, Stargell, Honus Wagner, and probably either Ralph Kiner or Bob Friend or like an elite pitcher. Because like Kutch was really good for a five-year stretch, but he didn't have that prime. Because unfortunately, starting in 2016, he – lost that MVP for him. I'm going to remember that MVP era. Like he was the great hope that Mm -hmm. led the pirates back to relevance. He was like part of that core leading him in dreads, just smacking baseballs, the walk-off home run against the Cardinals in the 14th (laughs) inning. And I remember just like going out the bar, just like high five and everybody that day. Cause I, I remember it was because like, it was a strike three that shouldn't never, that was um, not called. I believe I, I forget who was the hitter. I think it was Johnny Peralta. And then, like Cervelli got himself ejected like immediately after because the next pitch was a home run. AJ Burnett was actually a pitcher that game. He had a home run and they end up tying that game, bring everything back. Cardinals lead. Then Chris Stewart hits a nice seeing eye single uh, through the first base side ties the game up. So you you're down to like bare bones. I think Noah Greenwood was the pitcher. He was like a, you know, triple a guy didn't really do much at the big league level, but you had Neil Walker on first Andrew McCutcheon at the play tie up that smooth right-handed hit smack it and then you see center field once you hit the bushes explosion that's what i remember yeah. him for man and it was sad to see him go because it was like the end of an era i mean like i i thought you could have gotten more for him a year or two beforehand but it is what it is he went to what the giants he went to the giants they didn't perform well he, i think he was a yankee for a hot minute um he went to the yankees yeah, yeah, then he got signed by the, he yep and then he yeah. got signed by the phillies for a few years then went to the brewers yeah 
Okay. Yep, like yep. He's still yeah, that, serviceable, but at the same time, it's like he's not MVP cuts. Like, I'm not expecting that. Yeah, no, his 2012 to 2015 campaign was that best four-year stretch yes, of his career. Yes. You know, the over 300 batting averages, the, you know, the 28-plus home run seasons. That, again, like Albert Pujols we were talking about a minute ago, clean, compact swing, bat on the back right shoulder, just kind of hitching the giddy up and then contact right through the zone. Just a pure classic swing for Kutch. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's projected to get 110 hits, 19 homers, and have an uh, on base percentage of 313, which is still extremely serviceable, but a batting average of 229. I mean, no, would, I mean, you have to consider modern batting averages. The average is 240 now. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's fair. And, and strikeouts are significantly higher than you know they've they've ever mm-hmm. been before. Yeah, yeah. You, Selling out for launch angle and power. That's the thing. Yeah, you're going to see him at some point, kind of like Albert Pujols, get that second wind. It could be in April. It could be in June. It might even be the last couple weeks of the season. But I think being back at, you know, that great ballpark in Pittsburgh and just the fans and just the camaraderie, he's going to catch his second win. And I think we all want to see that as baseball fans at a certain point that, you know, especially the Pittsburgh fans that have grown up and love, you know, McCutcheon, that mm-hmm. that will be just enjoyable, you know, day to day to day. Yeah, I think yep. he'll be starting caliber. I mean, with how weak the Pirates are right now, the prospects aren't really ready. You're probably rolling Kutch in left, Reynolds at center, Jack Sawinski in right. Excuse me, right field. So you're probably rolling with that lineup, give or take. Maybe a few pieces here and there, but for the uh, Connor Joe, maybe he is a right field as well. But for the most part, you're just like kind of rolling with that platoon for the time being. And left field, the PNC, it's a lot like a center field. Like, it is a very tough outfit. Like, Starling Marte was a really good left fielder for that reason because he was a center fielder playing left field. And if you're not used to that range, like, it could eat you alive, especially that left field notch. Yeah, it does have a very, very extensive outfield. Yes. Right field's usually the short porch with the Clemente wall. Yeah. Okay, uh, so let me ask you this. So Dominic just gave you a time machine for Christmas. You have the ability to bring back one of these pirates in their prime and build this team. So, you know, over the next five years around. Okay. Brian Giles, Mm. Jason Bay, Mm. Andrew McCutcheon. And Brian Giles, assuming he's not around any women. Mm. (laughs) Ooh, that's a tough call because Brian, (laughs) Brian Giles was a really good hitter. In his prime, like he was about 300, could take a pitch, usually ran on base. So he would really fit with the modern game. But prime Kutch, got to go prime Kutch just because of that defensive. Like, Wasn't Brian Giles also very good defensively early on? Yeah, but he was a corner outfielder. He was. Yeah, he was a right fielder. He had had a hell of an arm, though. Yes, he did have an arm, but it was his bat. That was the key with him. And he was good for at least 30 home runs a year. All right, I didn't hear anything about Jason Bay. He was the automatic no. Bay was good, but the problem is he's not at the same level to me as a Giles or a Kutch. Jason okay. Bay was really good, but he was never MVP caliber like those two. Okay, no. were you really bummed when Giles went to the Padres? Mm, at the same time, I feel like it, it, it was what the Pirates did. They just traded all their top players because I, I kind of expected it because it was the time, you know, Aramis Ramirez got traded for a can of beans. And it was like one of the worst trades in baseball history. And you, you realize, like, I remember reading at the time, like Kevin McClatchy, our owner at the time, like both like claimed he lost $30 million in three years after opening a ballpark. And it was weeks before the trade deadline. So Dave Littlefield had no leverage, but yeah, unfortunately, at that point you need, you yeah, need $30 but, uh, million. Dollars, yeah, you'll get yeah, it that way. McClatchy was an idiot. That's all I'm going to say. Like, <laughs> Uh, but like Chris Benson was injured at the time. So Ramirez was the guy to trade. I remember being pissed at that trade, but it was like, that's one of the like long-term bits I want to do is just like the 20 years of losing to the pirates. And I'll just, I'm going to rail on Dave Littlefield and it will be catharsis for me. Okay. Yeah. It's well, therapeutic. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I mean, as the question is like with Brian Giles though, I mean, I was more interested in seeing what the prospects were like once you saw like all the Perez and his upside, Jason Bay coming out of nowhere to be, be rookie of the year it is the stick i'm all i want to look up what the brian giles trade was do you remember yep it was uh brian giles for ollie perez jason bay and a minor league pitcher named okay. Corey stewart and okay. Corey stewart didn't make the big leagues but i think the thing at the time was it was either like they wanted sean burrows at the time okay. and that would have been a terrible trade because burrows never really developed and san diego didn't want to get rid of him but the thing was jason bay was in that trade by accident 
What they really wanted was Xavier Nady, but he was a better prospect or deemed a better prospect than Bay at the time. So San Diego said, no, like we don't want to give up Nady. So they settled on Jason Bay. They ended up getting Nady a little down the line, but I think that was for Ollie Perez, if I remember correctly. I remember I remember uh, Xavier Nady. He, he he was a decent friend of mine for a short period of time. He'd come in. I, I'd always see him at a, the store I was working Solid at. Solid hitter. Solid hitter. Yeah, yeah. And he, he ended up sticking, going back to the Pirates also, right? Later yeah, he on did. In, in 06. Yep, 06. And then they traded him to the Yankees. Then he went on to manage the Storm. Were you there, Dominic, when he was managing the Storm? No, that was a couple of years before I got there. I started with Lake Elsinore in 2017 through 2019. Okay. Yeah, Nady, you know, played, you know, was a player with Elsinore during his Padre days. And yes. then he ended up coming back and coaching. I want to say it was like somewhere between like 2012 to 2015 in that era somewhere. It had there. to be beyond that because uh, – Maybe? Yeah, because I had gotten to meet him there in, uh, when he was managing. And uh, I remember Will Myers being there in a rehab stint and Nady was the manager. So it had oh. to at least be 16, 17. So maybe it was the season right before because 2017 – uh no, we had Edwin Rodriguez as manager for two years before Tony Tarasco in 19. So Rodriguez was it, a shorter guy, right? With the he'd always wear the helmet, like no matter what. Yeah, no matter <laughs> what. He, I will say, out of my whole minor league baseball like broadcasting career, Edwin Rodriguez is probably one of the nicest men you will ever meet in baseball. Just yeah, he's, he's a genuine he's, human being. Sidebar, as I digress. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, he, he's a cool dude. Yeah. Um. Okay, so uh, let's talk real quick about just the overall um, off season for baseball. So a tree, who were some of, what were some of the moves that surprised you the most? And I guess the first one I do want to ask you about is uh, let's talk real quick about the San Francisco Giants situation. Mm -hmm. So they got both Carlos Correa and And Arson judge, Judge. Arson judge. You remember? Yeah, They (laughs) they still have Arson. They have (laughs) Arson. They didn't get his brother Aaron, but they still have Arson. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. It's like, uh, I don't know if you watch wrestling at all. It's kind of like the whole is, um, uh, what was his name? I don't know. Uh, guy with the guitar, Elias, his yeah. brother. Oh, you? the only guy with the guitar I know. Like, it's been a while since I've watched wrestling. It's Jeff uh, Jarrett. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. There's I'm, I'm like far Elias. back. Okay, no, okay. I don't know what that is, unfortunately. Okay. Okay. Uh, but, uh, but anyway, yeah. So they got both of those in air quotes and ended up with neither of those guys. So what was your mm-hmm. perception when all that first happened? I was expecting the giants to make noise, even though I don't know if that was the right call for them, because oh. if you think about it, their teams in like very aged, very injury prone. You had like defensive issues in the field. You had big regression from a lot of your guys that were made you really good in 2021. And you were potentially losing Carlos Redon, which they did. And it's, in the grand scheme of things, trying to find that big piece, it's been a disaster because you've come out with consolation prizes. But I mean, sorry, Michael Conforto and Mitch Haniger, solid players. They're not Aaron Judge. Like, I mean, even though Aaron Judge will probably demand more money and his back end's probably going to be brutal. And then Carlos Correa, he had the issue with his ankle. Like, and we don't know if it's like it's going to be a situation where in two or three years, like his ankle's going to be so destroyed, he barely plays. So I would say the biggest surprise for me is Carlos Correa going back to the twins. That was the last thing I expected because I mean, it was not just him. It was the Mets. Like the Mets were going to pay him a lot of money. Yep. And then they realized like, wait, your ankle is so screwed up. I don't want to pay you. And then like, I probably was an issue was the insurance wouldn't cover it in case like the stuff happened, because if there's like an issue under like insurance, isn't going to cover it. So Minnesota decided, you know what, we're going to take the risk and we'll just give you a shorter term deal. We're not going to get buried if it's say, you know, you can't play in three or four years. We just have to eat two. And then it's like, let's go for it. Yeah. At that point, the whole Carlos Correo situation was not, it was surprising when everything happened with the Giants, you think, and then the Mets kind of swoop in at what, like 4 a.m. in the morning, East yeah. Coast time. I'm and they at just it like, and I'm just sitting there like, really? Whoa. Yeah. And yep. you're thinking, oh, they're spending money, spending money. And then that falls through. After that, I think, Fernando, you and I and Todd may have been together on a podcast or even chatting saying it's got to be the Twins at this point because they know him the best. It's a consolation prize at the end of the day. Are the Twins going to make that much noise in the American League? Probably not, but they have a better – Central's wide open, though. Central's wide open. But when you're taking on the AL West or the AL East, 
you have a better shot with Correa than you probably do without Correa. So for them, it's almost like extra credit in school. If you get it, great. If you don't, well, it is what it yeah. is. The move I really like for them is getting Pablo Lopez. Very underrated pitcher. Really helps the rotation. And Luis Arias. Oh, uh, Arias, yeah. Because with Arias, like, he's obsolete now because you have Royce Lewis coming in. So you can yep. throw him at two, second base. Correa's short. You're set. Yeah. It's very familiar with the – that whole situation with Arez was very similar, I feel, to what the Angels could be doing because the Angels have a backlog of middle infield prospects. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. For days, especially with Zach Neto at the top, and then you have players that have already played like Michael Stefanik, and then Luis Renjifo's on a high right now, David Fletcher. You know, there's a plethora of – LeVon Soto. Mid, you know, LeVon Soto. So Andrew Velasquez. Seems- <laughs> Squiddy poo in the house. But we have so many <laughs> middle infielders at that point. You know, maybe the Angels at some point will take what the Twins did, you know, an eye for an eye at that point and maybe have yeah. to pull the trigger on a move. But, again, another topic, another day for Perry Manassian and, of course, the Angels owner, Artie Moreno. Mm-hmm. I'm going to say is I am so sorry. I thought you were free. I thought you were free. Free at last, free at last. No, we're not. <laughs> yeah, no, we'll, we'll, we'll get we'll get to the Artie Moreno tirade uh, soon. Um <laughs> Let me ask you, uh, Tree, from a you know Pirates fan's perspective, how would you rank the Angels' offseason if you had to give them a letter grade? So just a bit of a refresher. They just signed Matt Moore. Mm-hmm. They traded for uh, Gio Urshela. They traded for Hunter Renfro. Uh, they obviously signed Tyler Anderson. They uh, signed a guy like Jake Lamb on a minor league deal. Uh, uh, Brandon, Brandon Drow- Drury. Drury. Yep. Yeah, that's just a couple of the guys. I mean, there, there's a little bit of a longer list, but those are the main guys. What do you think? Well, gonna... I didn't realize they got Urshela. I thought he was still with the Twins. So, I oh, mean, yeah, I, must have, I must have missed that. Hmm. That was very early. They, early. Okay, that makes sense. I know they signed Tyler Anderson, so that's not a bad pickup if he can maintain his form in L.A. But um, I'm trying to think, because I'd say the biggest move was probably trying to get rid of Artie Moreno and his meddling, but – at the same time, your question lies in Shohei Otani. Like, I don't know if he's going to come back. I think he's decided it's like, look, Artie doesn't want to pay, go over the luxury tax. I'm not going to get paid. I'm not going to win. So I think this is kind of a last ditch effort to kind of shore up the depth and show Shohei that, hey, we can win here. And if you keep with us, we can do something. I think that's the last ditch effort. And if it fails, I don't know what you do. Because, I mean, if, if if it's July, you're 10 games under 500, you might be doing a Juan Soto and hope you can yep. get a rich return in prospects that's still not going to feel like it's enough. I mean, the difference with Juan Soto is he still had, what, two and a half years of control at that time? Mm-hmm. Yep. I, I think he's a free agent after this year. I think he's got one more year. Hmm. It might be a, it might be a player option year. I'm not 100% Oh, because sure. he's still on his, uh, you know, his arbitration. Oh. Oh, so he might indeed have two years, but yo, you know, he's a UF. Uh, he's um, sorry, it's uh, 2023 UFA after 2025. My bad, my bad. Okay, oh, yeah. Okay. So, so he, he still has a little bit of control. Um, yeah. okay. So obviously, there's a lot that could happen. But if you had to put a yes or no answer tree, is Otani leaving the Angels after this year? Depends on a lot of factors. Uh, give me an answer. I won't hold you to it. I just, <laughs> I, this is completely up in the air, man. I mean, honestly. No, no I'm going to say yes, because I don't know if Artie wants to go over the luxury tax. Unless you can find a way to get rid of Anthony Rendon, I'm not sure if you find a way to sign him. Yeah, yeah, you're going to have to give up a lot to get rid of Rendon. You're, we're talking, mm-hmm. you're going to have to pair him with two or three solid prospects. Yeah, I at mean, least to get B rid minus of, B-rated prospects. Yep. Exactly. I mean, to get rid of the Zach Kozar contract a couple of years ago, the Angels had to give up their first round pick from that year, Will mm-hmm. Wilson. Yes. So, and, and we're talking about a guy who, in theory, would still have two more years of control left, I believe. So, and we're talking almost $50 million still. So you're going to have to entice a team. I don't know, maybe like the pirates who are on a rebuild and have the cap space to, to take him on. But I don't know, man, I really don't see the, you know, even a team like the pirates taking on 50 million over two years. No, the pirates aren't going to take on that kind of deal unless like they're too small market to take on somebody like an Anthony Rendon. Yeah. No, the the angels would have to eat a big chunk of that. 50% retention at minimum. Yeah, but, then all, but that would also buy you out of some of those prospects, right? Because yeah, you're paying half of time, his salary. 
Yeah. Uh, yeah. But I think that's going to be the guarantee. Like, can you get Anthony Rendon in his prime and reduce salary? It's not going to be as bad. That's always I, been the key. I think the, the Pirates used to do that a lot with like former Yankees. AJ Burnett was one of them. Mm-hmm. So that was a big example. Yeah. I think the key at the end of the day with the entire Shohei Otani situation is to me, two factors. One, we all talk about Artie Moreno and the team. Are they going to be winning? Because if he was in a contract year last year and with that whole 14 game losing drink and everything that happened, Otani would have been gone if this oh, was he, a year he, prior. He, he would have been gone at the deadline. He would have been gone. But I think what a lot of people were underrating with Shohei Otani and people aren't asking this question is everybody says, oh, he's this two way phenom. He's going to want money. He's going to be a 50 to $60 million a year type man. Shohei, at least to the public, to me as an Angel fan, he doesn't seem like that person where it's like, I'm all about the money. I need to be the biggest, highest paid player in baseball. No. Do, do yeah, I see That's him? a Manny Machado kind of guy. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, so, that's why Machado's opting out of his deal. Like he's going to get paid. Exactly. Yeah. So I think the wild card factor in this whole situation is if Otani is okay with being what, maybe a 25 to 35 million a year player, which is severely less what a lot of people think he's going to be. Yeah. What does that mean? Does that open some options for the angels because of the whole payroll luxury tax situation with Artie Moreno? Does he actually tell the truth and I'm actually going to go over the tax? I think that's all the small minute details. They're going to make a bigger factor than what everybody's talking about right now with Otani and, Oh, he needs to be the richest man in baseball to prove that baseball is, you know, this type of game here in 2023. I, I really don't think that's going to be the end all be all for Shohei. I think he'll, I don't think he's going to get 25 to 35 million, but I don't think he's going to be higher paid. I think he wants to win. I think he wants to experience yes. playoff baseball and win a world series. I think he gets at least 40 million, but he's going to go like, if, if it doesn't work out for the angels, just watch him go to a team like the Padres, the Mariners or the Dodgers. The I Dodgers, think he stays yeah. on the West coast Dodgers. I mean, here's the thing, you know, everyone says that Otani wants to win and that he's not about the money. That, that seems to be a pretty common theme that I'm hearing from baseball mm-hmm. fans. You know, he doesn't give that aura of, I just want money. Okay, so with that being said, shouldn't he, of all people, understand that if he's taken $40 million a year, for example, that's going to handicap any team. It doesn't matter if they go over the luxury tax. $40 million is a very large amount, you know, potentially for one year, for one player. If you're one of the best players in the game, you got an agent like Scott Boris, he's going to milk every penny he can. But he doesn't have an agent like Scott Boris. Yes, yeah, he but is. But at the same time, <laughs> you're representing your best interests. Like Absolutely. 25 to 35 million, if I'm Shohei Otani, I'm firing my agent. No, I, I think I, at that I, point, I you, you could see maybe Shohei, depending on the years of his contract, because is it going to be, you know, he's going to be 29 years old this season. So a 10, 11 year deal. You know, if you go 10, 11 like Xander Bogarts gets and a couple other free agents this year that got higher years and less AAV, you're going to see Shohei going into his age 40 plus season. Does he backload that contract to help the team now where you still have prime Mike Trout, Anthony Rendon, if he gets healthy and everything goes right for him, you still got some younger players that are cheaper, like a Taylor Ward and Jared Walsh and Mm -hmm. Luis Renjifo and David Fletcher that can still make an impact to this angels lineup, but not cost 20, 30, 40 million. So maybe they take that as a backload contract or does he take the Carlos Correa approach of, okay, I'll sign an eight year deal, but I have an opt out after year three, just in case if, you know, you know, shit hits the fan. I would love I that kind of contract with Otani, but I mean, nowadays, especially in sports and we see it happening in football, especially now it's all about guaranteed money. And I understand yes. baseball is all guaranteed money, but if you have an opt out that's, you know, insinuated by yourself, maybe it's a little different. Like for instance, when Manny Machado signed this deal with the Padres back then, the Padres were not a good team. We knew it was all about the money for Manny Machado. Mm-hmm. It wasn't until recently when they started contending, but back then everyone's like, dude, this guy went there for the money. The Padres suck ass. So now it's just about securing the bag. Right. And if you can secure your bag, like Otani has the best odds of anybody in professional sports coming up this off season. If Shohei Otani does not sign and, you know, having a Pirates fan on here as a objective as we can possibly be, except for, you know, Fernando and I just being angel lovers. And as Todd would say, you know, our honkiness is coming out right now. <laughs> but, you know, we heard in the press conference at the start of spring training, Mike Trout says, I'm going to do everything I can to keep Shohei Otani. It would suck if he leaves, but I know he wants to be here and I know he loves us. And he, I get he knows what we're trying to accomplish here. 
if Shohei does leave, do you think at any point the media or fans start turning to Mike Trout and saying, why can't you retain big names here with the Angels that actually compete? Is it, I don't want to say necessarily, is it a Trout problem? But, you know, we always talk about that one guy on every team that is at the table, at the negotiating meeting, say, hey, come with us, enjoy us. You know, we see it in the NBA. LeBron James is that kind of guy, top player. You see it in football. Typically, it's the quarterback for every team. Is Mike Trout in the driving seat, and does he get put with any blame? Or like, hey, Mike, why why are we losing all these players? You know, does he have to answer as the quote-unquote captain of this team? I don't really know about that. I feel like people are more or less going to blame Moreno for that instead of Mike Trout because people know Mike Trout is probably the best player in the league. But at the Mm -hmm. same time, baseball has complained that Trout doesn't really put himself out there as a personality. He's always been an introvert. He's never been a kind of guy who's like put his like, you know, heart on his sleeve and been emotional and talk. He's more just a lead by example type. So I don't know if he's going to be the kind of guy that – gets really blamed if a situation goes south. But at the same time, I think there will be some unfair criticism thrown his way if he can't stay healthy. Yeah. That would make sense because he should be at the negotiating table no matter what. If you're already Moreno or Perry Manassian, Mike Trout is an asset to any free agent. So you think he would be involved in nearly every single aspect that it comes to this team. At this point in his career, now that he's been there for you know, over a decade, you think he gets a little more, you know, value to that name, especially in the front office caliber of, mm-hmm. you know, of being the organization. Be yeah, no doubt. Yeah. I mean, let's be honest. If you're the angels, your best marketing chip is Mike Trout, right? You need a guy like Mike Trout to be like, Hey, mm-hmm. Shohei, I'm just as frustrated as you are, but I love it here. Don't you love it here? Like, you know, that's, that's what you need, right? It, it's even with a guy like Otani around, I still think the face of your franchise has to be Mike Trout because he's a homegrown guy, right? Mm-hmm. He had the opportunity to leave multiple times, right? But he, you know, he he signed two extensions with the Angels, and now he's seemingly here for life, bearing anything happening, you know, some kind of trade where he waves his no trade clause or something if yeah. it gets so bad. If he wants to go to Philly and, you know, live out a childhood dream, something like that. Yeah, exactly. Right. I, I I don't know why. I don't know. I he, mean, he, he that really would probably be the... like a twilight career. That wouldn't be like right now. I don't think he's going to do that. Yeah, yeah. No. I, I don't think so either. But um, it, it's a really, really hard situation, right? I mean, naturally, as Angels fans, you don't want to see Shohei Otani play every, any, anywhere else, right? I mean, there's, mm-hmm. there's no denying that a healthy Shohei Otani – it's the most talented baseball player I've ever seen in my lifetime. I don't think anybody could possibly dispute that. He's a rare unicorn. Like he's done things baseball hasn't seen in over a century. I mean, I don't think, I think he's done things that nobody's ever seen period. A Babe Ruth never threw hundred miles an hour. No, you know, Babe Ruth uh, never pitched the same day that he hit for multiple years in a row. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, I think he did that for I think his first two years when he was with the Red first Sox. couple of years, and then he got traded to the Yankees. They made him a full time hitter. Yeah. Exactly, and now, then you do it at the All Star game if you're Shohei Otani. Put that on paper. Mm-hmm. That's that. That's what I'm saying. And you know, I, I I tease people all the time, especially the older generation. They well, you know, Babe Ruth was playing against a bunch of plumbers, but I mean, the what we're seeing out of Otani is absolutely incredible. And to be honest, no matter where he ends up, I'm going to always be an Otani fan. The guy seemingly has done everything the right way. Literally, nobody knows a damn thing about him. You would think he literally just lives in baseball stadiums and that's it. You never see him in public. You never hear about him in public. What the hell does he like eating? We don't know any of this stuff. How dare you, Fernando? (laughs) Remember his Starbucks order was made famous last year. How many times, how long, how many years did you wait to figure out his Starbucks order? You You know know what I mean? I lost sleep. (laughs) <laughs> I lost so much sleep last season not knowing what his Starbucks order was. It was yeah. so death defying. <laughs> what is his Starbucks order? <laughs> That's a great I don't question. Remember. I have no I don't idea. <laughs> <laughs> it was all over Twitter. You can sleep on a Starbucks order and you don't even know it. What is your decorum, man? That's su- shady. Yep. super yeah. Stephen A. Smith of you. I know. I'm yeah. not. I must. <laughs> as Fernando would know, I'm just not that much of a halo honk. I'm not Roger Lodge anymore. Yeah, there you go. There you go. <laughs> Okay, so years we'll... of apathy will do that, unfortunately. I mean, same mm-hmm. with the pirates. <laughs> so, uh, you know, speaking of pirates and, and angels, uh, they both had a historic trend uh, of just bad ownership over the last decade. Mm-hmm. Um, 
So with that being said, we've alluded a little bit to Artie Moreno, and maybe before we go back to MLB, before you know we start slowly wrapping things up here, let's real quick talk about Artie Moreno. Now we we first had you on because you had the Artie Moreno video that came out yes. entitled the, "The Dark Knight." Uh, was it a baseball or LA? The Dark Angel of oh, okay. um, of of uh, Anaheim, I think it was. The Dark Angel of Anaheim, I think. Uh, we'll we'll that's... leave it linked down down below. So if you oh, haven't oh, watched oh. the Rudy Trees video. Make sure to check a his channel out and be the video out. Uh, so we haven't talked to you since he made the announcement that he was going to sell the team. Mm -hmm. What was your immediate reaction when you heard that? I'm just in there. Thank God. Thank God. Cause like he was the one holding the angels back. If you think about it, Oh, was like over the past like decade, he has mostly been trying to get these big free agent signings, meddling and executive affairs that he didn't really know anything about. Like he was the one that was responsible for, you know, most of the worst contracts in angels history, Josh Hamilton, and then threw him under the bus for nothing. Albert Pujols, Vernon Wells, Albert, um, you know, Anthony Rendon, he was under him, like under doing trades for Jock Peterson and a couple of other guys, Andy pages would be pretty good in the, uh, in your system, unfortunately. And then there was also Joe Madden, where you know he the mail to get him and then fire him out of the blue. And suddenly it's like, oh, we're just gonna settle for Phil Nevin, even though he didn't really do much because the whole team was lost by that point. So he speaks of unfinished business, but I feel like he's grown content with just like you know, all the record profits he's getting from his TV deal. Like he could have sold, got tenfold profit because he's he bought the team for 150 million dollars and yeah. now it's worth over two billion. Why do you honestly think that he did not pull the trigger, uh, you know, two months ago? I think he enjoys the power. I think he enjoys the power of being the, an owner of a team. I think he enjoys the reputation. I think he enjoys like that sort of executive meddling in a way of like control. Because as a business owner, what you want is control. You want to have some hunger. Yep, you want yep. purpose. And I think that's what the Angels do. I know, like, I think having the uh, the stadium deal, which was too good to be true, if you look at it in hindsight, kind of fall apart due to political corruption. Like, I think that kind of stung because, like, that was going to make him, like, one of the richest men in America, let alone the world. Because, I mean, you have those new shops, the, the like the stadium rights, the parking area around it, too. Yeah. Like he could have made buku bucks with that, but yeah. now unfortunately, it's um that fell through the wayside, and I think that was part of the reason why he wanted to sell. Yeah, I, I, I that it was convenient timing, right? That right after yeah. all that came out, you know, the mayor of Anaheim stepped yep. down, resigned. Hey, I'm gonna sell the team, and I think most baseball fans had the exact same reaction you had. I mean. It was the relief of, okay, the big bad wolf is finally leaving. I mean, there you're absolutely right. The cloud that has been Artie Moreno has just been not even overwhelming as an Angels fan. It's been overwhelming for baseball. Baseball. you know, He's not good for baseball at all. He's like one of those unheralded owners that usually slinks through the side because, you know, you've had worse owners in the past. I mean, yeah. you had, you know, Jeffrey Loria, Dan Snyder. Uh, a couple other really bad owners as well, but Artie Moreno's always slunk through because, like, you know, Anaheim's not considered a big market. Yeah, you know, that's why they've tried to uh, go to Los Angeles and stuff like that. Who's the Clippers so, owner before? Donald Sterling. Yeah, yeah. there you go. <laughs> He's yeah, right. Exactly. Donald he was, Sterling coming yes. in there. Yeah. And uh, they wanted Donald Sterling out a long time ago. David Stern protected him. He yeah. Was a terrible owner. Terrible. Hey, well, he should have been out 20 years earlier. If it makes yeah. you feel any better, Rob Manfred came out in support of Artie Moreno. So you guys oh, should be. <laughs> yes, uh, yes uh, Rob Manfred, he of uh, uh, trying to expand baseball when you have huge issues still in Tampa Bay and Oakland. Yes, uh, yeah. absolutely worth it. Yeah, yeah Fernando, so I mean, you took the words right out of my mouth. I was just about to say, this is a guy, Artie Moreno, we're talking about. Rod Manfred reveres him and says yeah. he's one of the best owners in baseball. He's yeah. one of the classiest guys. He has Dick have... Monfort as the representative of his labor. The dude can, yeah. can, can barely pay anyone. And if without... I'm Artie Moreno, I'd look at Rob Manfred and said, oh, you love me, but you criticize the best player in baseball, one of the top three players in baseball, Mike yes. Trout, for not being marketable the day mm -hmm. before the All-Star game. Yes. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. That sounds like an oxymoron problem happening yep. in Major League uh, Baseball. Well, all you need to know is he supports the Ghost Runner, and it goes against the whole tradition thing of baseball, yet yep. you won't automate the strike zone. 
So, well, done. they're doing it in AAA this year. So, yes, I mean, it, it's I very mean, likely it the next year. Too. Blind colors. Yeah. yeah. It, I think baseball is just focusing on the wrong things. They're trying to focus on game speed when in reality, I feel like the ease pace of baseball, especially come playoff time, really adds to the tension. I know it's a long time yep. in terms of gameplay, but every pitch had that tension. And that's what makes yep. playoff baseball baseball. If you speed it up, it's just not the same. Yeah, I, I, you know, in all fairness, when you compare all the major sports, with the exception of, of hockey, really, they're all within the same like 20 ish minute time frame, right? I mean, football yes. games are almost just as long as baseball games, especially mm-hmm. with the commercial breaks. And yes. I don't see people complaining much about football games. Yeah, maybe there's a little more action, but I mean, sometimes watching football games between plays yeah, that gets it's cool. not action though i mean that you only have one quarter of real play for the most yeah. part it's either just sitting around waiting for the huddle or just letting time burn for strategy yeah absolutely i think the problem that baseball with baseball has been trying to appeal too much to the just the common folks yep they're losing the traditionalists yeah but the, the problem is yeah, I think what they see is baseball's like like fan base is aging and they want to try and replace it with a younger, hipper audience. But unfortunately, the younger audience, just because of like how like we like are wired now with social media, instant gratification, we can get anything up on the click of a hand. Uh, we, we think it's, you know, slow and boring. I mean, it's just the way like most of us are wired. It's just the way we grew up. Like nowadays, like, oh, if I want to find something on the internet, I can do a little Google search, find it immediately. Back in the day, you had to go through hoops and ladders just to find anything. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. You have to go to an encyclopedia. So I think point. that's why they want to try and speed it up. Yeah, but, you know, once again, you're you're almost isolating your 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 audience. You know what I mean? I mean, people like us, like, I don't need the game to be that much faster. Let's instead worry about making the game more fair. Let's worry about, you know, maybe getting some of the, for instance, when you go to a game and they challenge a play, there needs to be like a 20 or 30 second decision period. It needs to be quick. Fortunately, yeah. they actually have to announce the reason why they stopped the play or whatever, instead of like yeah. just doing a random question. And then they have, the announcers are just perplexed, like the half inning after it's like they did it yeah, for yeah. that. Right? Wait, what? Well, I mean, yeah. did, did you watch any XFL games last week, Tree? A little bit. I didn't okay. really get much play by play, but I did get like a lot of the engines with the, um, with the replay booth, which was, you know, very, I love that. I love that. That the NFL is pro. I feel like they're going to, they might try to steal that. I doubt that. You think so? Cause what I can say, the refs union is very powerful. Okay. Yeah. And the the true NFL script cannot be revealed. Oh no. Never. never. All that. Yeah. That. Yeah. So they will never have that with the XFL does the NFL will never, the day that happens, hell has frozen over. Yes. Because what I will say is, man, that X, the, the XFL games I did watch, some of the best sports gameplay I've ever seen in my life. Just unprecedented access, the way you can hear the coaches talking to the players and the huddles. And uh, the, real, the real reason I brought it up is just because, like you said, the reviewing of the plays is, is awesome. And the fact that they only have a short period of time to make a decision. That I love that because nothing's worse than when they stop the game for about two or three minutes to figure out if a guy was safe or he was if he was picked off at first base or whatnot. That's just mm. sometimes it takes too long. I understand yeah. for like a big home run or something, obviously. Uh, problem is like when you go frame by frame, that's what you have to kind of do, unfortunately. Yeah. Major League Baseball is more worried about the quantity almost of baseball than the quality of the product of baseball. Of course. You have 162 games. I mean, the logical explanation would be to drop it to maybe 146 games. So every game is a little more important, but at the same time, it's still that tradition angle that they don't want to hang on to, but they'll yeah. have a ghost runner and extras to try and speed up the game. And uh, Yeah, I hate not, that. Yeah. yeah. You think we'll ever see baseball uh, lower the amount of games in our lifetime? Depends on the TV contracts. I mean, once again, with the RSNs in Bally Sports, mm-hmm. I don't know what happens there. I feel like what could happen is baseball ends up consolidating, makes their own networks, and they like divide that up, and they make more money just from the rights from the cable companies. They just screw the middleman. I think they can do it now, and I think I they'll think- be the trend center. Like the NHL, too, Like as they have a lot of like teams that are represented by Bally. 
Yeah, I think at the end of the day, I think once we all figure out what's going on with the Tampa Bay Rays and the Oakland A's, yes, it, or in you know that entire situation, and Manfred gets his wet dream of adding one or two more teams and expanding yeah. the league a little bit, I think once that picture comes into frame then you could potentially see, hey, there's more teams in the league now that shorten up the games because there's going to be more travel now. It's mm-hmm. going to be, I think, really at the end of the day, shortening the schedule will come from we need less travel time and yeah. condensing the schedule, adding maybe a few extra days off depending on where teams are going. Mm-hmm. And especially if you add another international team like a an MLB team in Mexico. Yes. As some, you know, that or San Juan, Puerto Rico. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That can really factor into the decision of shortening maybe from 162 to 146 or, you know, basically shaving off two weeks of the season, essentially. Yeah, because uh, uh, playoff wise, you're starting technically second week of October. You're going into November. Yeah. Which, I mean, if you look in the past, like baseball season ended late September, early October at its best because they played a ton of double headers. That's why they played 162 games. Nowadays, Mm -hmm. Different travel every time. I mean, the players by July, August, I mean, you're in like sort of a loopy days just playing baseball all the time. You're in a random hotel like, wait, where the hell am I now? It's yeah. like that sort of thing. So yeah. I feel like if you can cut the number of games, you maintain the salary or like, you know, prorate it by maybe like X percent, like 5%, you know, give them a little break as well. I think the players would be uh, go along with that. Okay. Um let me ask you, uh, WBC, are you excited to watch the World Baseball Classic? A little bit, yes. Um, I know for the most part, I'm just like, I've never really been huge on the World Baseball Classic, but I'm going to try and focus on it this year. Okay. Can we expect some content? Eh, maybe. I'm trying to think. Like, um, I know, like, I'm trying to figure out, like, like what's on the mind, what the ideas are for the most part, but uh, maybe. We'll see. I mean, I... I talked about doing a world cup vid but i feel like it's too late now i just didn't have the time and it's just like the constraints that's what the last time i did it was in the summer and i was able to devote time to it now it's just like yeah great so. okay well i guess we'll wait to see if anything comes out in the world baseball because who do, who do you have winning Ooh, probably ooh. dominican has a really deep lineup don't they always yeah <laughs> well, i mean it's, like, it's more loaded than usual <laughs> Yeah, that's yeah this is a very loaded year for, for the Dominican. I think at the end of the day, this is probably going to be, I don't want to say the most watched, or it could be because the day and age that we are, but it might be the most competitive world baseball classic that there's ever been just because of the crop of talent with a yes. lot of these countries. I think it's safe to say, it's almost like, you know, March Madness is coming up. You know, you're going to have those surprise, you know, 15, 16 mm-hmm. seeds come in and upset I don't know if we're going to see as many of that here in yeah. baseball. I think Team Japan's going to be stacked. Oh, yeah. Team USA is going to be stacked. The mm-hmm. Dominican is stacked. And then you're going to have a, th- a fourth team in there. Yeah, like Venezuela, Mexico, Nicaragua, Colombia. I mean, obviously, it's- like, I'm on Team Israel. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, you know, there's, there's a lot of teams that could be in there. But I really do feel at the end of the day, it, it could be USA, Dominican in the finals. That, mm-hmm. you that- know. That would be That'll pretty be intense. Reasonable. Very reasonable. I, but what is, but Fernando, I'm going to ask for World Baseball Club, I'm going to flip it to you for a second. Okay. What happens when Otani has to pitch to Mike Trout? Because it's going to happen. I'm super excited. I mean, did you, I'm sure you saw the video of Mike Trout back flipping off Patrick Sandoval, and Patrick Sandoval is pitching for Team Mexico. And they're going to they're gonna be facing each other in the first they're, round, potentially. They're in the same bracket, yes. Exactly. So there's a very good chance we'll get to see that matchup, and that alone will be fun. But, man, if there is a dream situation where Otani is facing Mike Trout, A, for, for starters, that would be great for Major League Baseball. The problem with Major League Baseball and the World Baseball Classic, they don't market it the way they should. The yeah. World Cup is an event. Everybody watches the World Cup. People who don't yep. care about soccer watch oh, the World Cup. Oh, yes. I watch yes. the World Cup every four years. And, you know, the other three and a half years, I don't care. I'll watch a couple of World Cup qualifiers. But once the World Cup comes on, I'm all in. The world is religion. Yes. And we don't have that worth the World Baseball Classic. One of the biggest reasons, most people don't even know it exists. Even some... Hardcore it's been a baseball. while because I think the last time it got postponed due to the pandemic or some other factors. Yep. Mm-hmm. yep, yep. 17 was the first, or was the mo- last year we had it. 
Yeah. And then 21 was supposed to happen, but you know, COVID was still yeah. a pretty big thing in various parts of the world. Yeah, no way you could do it like in that sort of thing. You were going through the Omicron variant. No way you could have. Yeah, exactly. the, Olympi- the Olympics barely happened at that Wait, point. Wait, that was the Delta exactly. variant. Yeah. It, it was one of 65 variants we've had, you know. Yeah. So it was it was mm-hmm. definitely a very rough time, especially like I said, for specific pockets of the world, they were hit even harder. Yes. But um yeah, we were robbed the opportunity of watching Tim Tebow represent Team Philippines. That's that's the biggest thing. <laughs> we <Yes>. were robbed. <laughs> but who who ends up winning that battle? If it's Otani on the mound and Trout at the dish, Ooh. who wins that battle? Because I think you know they're that first time it happens, they're both literally gonna look at each other and just flat out laugh at each other, even though even if it's a semifinal game, they're both gonna look and be like. What the heck is this about? We're teammates. You want to be nice. And then, you know, as soon as Trout steps in the box and Otani's got the ball, it's like, okay, game. It's going to be bragging rights. It's that sort of thing. Ooh. I think it's going to depend on who pays more attention to the other. You know, does Shohei Otani pay attention to those Mike Trout at bats when he's in the dugout or on the on deck circle and vice versa? How much uh, attention does Mike Trout pay attention when Otani's pitching and he's in center field? You know, Mm -hmm. you got to know the person you're facing. And when you're essentially facing a person who you, in theory, watch every day. Yeah, I don't know. You know Perry Manassian is going to sit them down if it ever happens, say, (laughs) Otani. And and he'll tell Ipe this to translate. Do not throw anywhere high and inside to Mike Trout. We do not need one of your 9,800 mile an hour fastballs to slip away and hit Trout in the face and basically screw our season up. (laughs) <laughs> and have just issues with the fan base of everything. So it'll be a very interesting scenario of how it happens. I will say if I had a pick, Shohei Otani's just straight dirt. You know, not in a bad way, but just he's just straight dirty on that mound with everything that he throws. I think he's going to beat Trout, at least in that first head-to-head plate appearance. Otani is going to pick up the win in that battle. I would say Otani too. I'm kind of leaning that way as well. Yeah. But Mike Trout, if he gets a dinger off Otani, oh, Otani will never let that down. That could be the nail in the coffin to say Otani's <laughs> going to stay as an angel because I don't want to have to pitch against Mike Trout ever again. <laughs> it, it, it'll, it'll be really, really fun to watch. Um, yeah. I, I would say you probably have to give the slight edge to Otani, right? I mean, you know, Otani, when he's on, is one of the best pitchers in baseball. I would imagine he probably knows how to pitch Mike Trout. You know, Mike Trout uh, always swings at the high cheese. Oh, and he's really good at anything that breaks down in the zone. I think Otani knows that. So yeah. as long as he can keep the ball up, I, I think he might have a slight edge. I don't know if he'll strike out Mike Trout, but I think he'll be able to keep him in check during the game. No disrespect to Trout, but I just, you know, I think Otani has has the edge. Mm-hmm. All right. So now slowly starting to wrap up here. Uh, once again, we want to thank you for coming on uh, Urinating Tree. Make sure to check out his YouTube channel. We'll get to that at the end. Uh in terms of some other major moves that happened this off season, besides the one we've already talked about, what do you think is the biggest one? Is it Dansby Swanson, like going to the Cubs? Is it Aaron judge deciding to take less money to stay with the Yankees? I would say it's what the Mets did. I mean, they are trying to do what Mr. I did and do everything in their power to win a world series. I mean, I missed it in the video, but could I sing a Japanese sensation coming oh, yep, up? Yep. Justin Verlander. Rolling with him and Scherzer back again, keeping Nimmo and Edwin Diaz. Like, there were the rumors they could have been gone. I mean, they did lose DeGrom, but once again, you're bringing in Justin Verlander. And so DeGrom's already that. having then, injury issues. Mm-hmm, yep, yeah, it got pulled out for tightness, but it, hopefully it's short term. But, I mean, at the same time, you did keep McNeil. I mean, Alonso is your next target for, like, you know, an extension. They almost signed Correa. So I think they're <laughs> going to be the big piece, especially with what other teams in the NL East did. You know, they have Sean Murphy going to Atlanta to get that extra defensive help at catcher. Trey Turner going to the Phillies for their final piece for their hitting core. Uh, the Nationals probably selling their team. The Dolphin or the Marlins trying to get you know you know batting champion Luis Arise, but at the same time they don't really have much power. Uh, but at the same time, I feel like what the Mets did, I feel like they're trying to go above and beyond, especially with some of the competition they have in the National League. Don't forget the Padres getting Xander Bogarts. That mm-hmm. was a big one. I, they, they had a yeah. chance to get Aaron Judge. Yeah, I'm, But once again, I don't think they were big on Aaron Judge. But like Bogarts, like 
I, I it seems a bit excessive because Hashon Kim was pretty good for them. Plus, you moved Absolutely. Turner with the first base. And with like it's the same thing with Turner. Like you have no opt-outs and uh, no trade clause. So it's a very risky maneuver, especially for that back end. So you're going for these next couple of years saying, like, look, this is our time. We're gonna push. Especially this year with the Padres, when Manny Machado's gonna opt out, he might be gone. So yeah. I think that Bogart's move is probably in anticipation of Manny Machado probably could be. Out. But where do because they move? Who do they put at third base? They'll probably. I wonder if they put Bogart at third, Tatis back to short, and then they have Hassan Kim at second and Cronenworth at first. That could be the potential infield moving forward. Because Kim maybe. only has one year of control left after this. Well, and that's if AJ Preller doesn't go out and spend more money. Yeah. On anybody I, else, you I know? think the I think the ownership is kind of breathing down Preller's neck because them advancing to the con like the NLCS last year saved Preller's ass. Like if they flamed out early or they missed the playoffs, he was gone. Yeah, it's been a quick turn for Preller because you know just a couple of years ago he was stacking the minor system, hoping for the best, and now they've completely done a one eighty. So he was on he was on fire for, hey, you're holding on to too many pieces. We need to win now. Now it's, you have all the pieces, they're veterans, and you sold yeah. the farm. You need to win. So it's kind but of- the problem is, to too, like, they were still throwing money at a lot of free agents when they were still pretty rough. Eric Hosmer, he didn't work out. Manny Machado. So you have a couple guys you were still trying to bring in and, like, yeah. really bolster that core. And if the Padres were going to do it, this is the year to do it. I still- You have to. The Dodgers are still going to be competitive in the NL mm -hmm. West, but- in my opinion, I think the Padres are going to be favored a little bit just by a few games over the Dodgers because the Dodgers had a, in my opinion, a quiet off season. They and lost a lot of talent. Like they, they did. They wanted to get rid of that luxury tax penalty. That's why they cut a lot of pieces, and they've lost a lot of veteran influence. They, I mean, they did bring in some guys, but at the same time, you can't tell me that JD Martinez, Miguel Rojas. You know, Noah Syndergaard, David Peralta, solid players, especially Absolutely. in the past. But with all the talent they lost, you can't tell me that they're going to replace every single thing that left. Do you no, think they're going to have a significant – I don't want to say regression. They're, they're still probably going to make the playoffs. I mean, these are the Dodgers. Yeah, I But think do you that... really think they're, they might actually be out of the a division this year? Mm, it depends. I mean, there's a lot that can happen. I know we talked about last year – how the White Sox were going to run away with the AL Central and they just fell yeah. apart. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they shut the bed. Yeah, I think the Dodgers will regress a little bit this year. They're still going to be competitive. I think we also yeah. agree on I that. I say like mid 90s wins. I say that. Yeah, yeah, I'll go look, you know, I'd say 92 to 95 wins in that regard. If the Padres stay healthy and have no health problems, they will be the ones to beat in the NOS because the Rockies and Diamondbacks aren't going anywhere. The Giants no. probably aren't going anywhere. Yeah. The Rockies you know, think they can play 500 ball. I don't think they're going to make the playoffs. If, if the no. Padres take care of business in those head to head games against the Dodgers, that's going to be where you could see the difference maker. And again, mm -hmm. with the schedule changing now this year with everybody playing everybody and you have yes. less divisional games, yep. that could also play into potentially the Padres favor, you know, they're going to be playing a lot of the bad teams in the AL central, the Royals and the, you know, both. Well, I don't want to say both tigers. Bad now tigers. the tigers, you know, the, both yeah, the, the A's and the fire anymore. sale. Exactly. Yeah. So that could help the Padres a little bit. They have the, you know, Padres on paper have the names and on paper, they should clearly win that division by mm. I'd say eight or more games, but you know, health is always a reason. We say that every year with the Angels. On paper, Absolutely, yep. their offense could be probably second best behind the Houston Astros. But has it has it clearly worked out that way? No, it has not. Nope. All right, so the last question I have for both of you guys. Super, super early, right before spring training starts, give me your World Series prediction right now. This is bearing injuries. Oh, this gosh. is in a, in a vacuum where people stay healthy. These are the rosters that stay. You know, there's no trades or anything. There's no injuries in a vacuum. Who's making the World Series? Goodness gracious. I, mean, I got to think about that. Ooh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll give you a second. I'm I'm taking the Mets. Oh, the AL one's going to be hard. We're queuing up the Jeopardy music right now. I mean, I'm, listen, I'm really thinking on this here for I'm, a second. I'm going to say Mets Astros. 
Yeah, I, I either want to say Astros or the Rays. You can never count the Rays out, ever. The ever. Rays are weird because if they stay healthy, they may be okay, but the injuries destroyed them last year. I yeah. think the Jays could make a run, potentially. Yep, yep. I, Blue um, Jays was my was probably my, my second option. They were my pick last year to make it to the World Series, and that didn't happen. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah. you saw the movie, right? It was it was a really good movie. They blew it an uh, eight to one lead. It was beautiful. Yeah. No. Yeah. <laughs> I would say if we're talking in a vacuum way early right now, it, it again, it sucks to say this as an Angels fan, but it's really hard to go against the Houston Astros right now. They yes. of course are proven contenders. They really didn't do much to their team this offseason, but they still have a quality team, depthy team as well. So I would put the Houston Astros and honestly for me, the four teams in the National League are going to be, right now, Padres, Mets, Phillies, Braves. Something yeah. about the Braves, they're always pesky. They're just a terrific, great organization that's well-run. Out of those four teams, I'll be a little contrarian because I know everybody's going to say the Mets. I'm going to go with the Phillies. Phillies, Astros, it's going to be a repeat. Mm-hmm. Brandon Marsh. <laughs> Brandon Marsh. You know, we got to love Brandon Marsh. <laughs> Angel, but, hey, the Phillies retool. I don't want – well, yeah, I guess you could say retooled with Trey Turner and a lot of bullpen pieces. Bryce Harper is going to be a little bit healthier this year than he was. You know, Brandon Marsh, an in, in extra offseason with the Phillies hitting coaches, he could be a revelation and, you know, comeback player of the year, Um, even though there wasn't really an injury or anything to come back from. But to come back from your, you know – dismal angels career that could be a comeback within itself but the phillies want to prove something and i feel the nl east even though the nationals and the marlins aren't much to talk about that nl east division is premier and pretty dynamo with those three teams top. that is a three-headed monster every time must see baseball i think anytime those three teams head to head with each other f's in the chat for the washington nationals they are going to get destroyed (laughs) absolutely yeah, who is the best player on the Washington Nationals now? I would probably say it has to be Mackenzie Gore. Place. <laughs> Mackenzie Gore, Gore could be G- yeah. could be Gore, could be um, you know, CJ Abrams. Yeah. Oh, yeah, CJ Abrams. Well, basically, it could be Joey Manessis if it's like those two months in August meant anything. Maybe. So basically just say somebody that was in the Padres system from like 3 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> Pick much. their prospects. All right. So Absolute last question, Tree, I have before we send it off. You don't need to explain. I just want a yes or no answer because you've already kind of talked a little bit about what you think about the Angels. Do the Angels make the playoffs this year? Do they get the monkey off their back? I think they just miss. So the answer is no. The the AL is too loaded. That's the problem. Okay, so they were the NL. (laughs) No, it'd be the same thing. The NL West is absolutely stacked. The only chance to be maybe the NL Central. So you may have a chance to sneak into a wild card. I could see that. Okay. But at the same time, you need a lot. You need everything to go right. Yeah, it could happen. I oh, think f- Angels in the outfield. It could happen. Yeah, mm-hmm. I, f- I always yeah. could. Quick take. I know for Fernando and I will continue to be talking about this with the Angels. I'll I'll make it short and brief here. Astros right now, looking at the teams going into spring training. Astros are the AL West champ. In mm-hmm. uh, not Indians. Pardon me. That's politically incorrect. The Guardians will be AL and Central. He's canceled. Uh, uh, Cleveland, maybe. I can see Minnesota making a push. It's a, a three-way. If Chicago ever gets their shit together, they can win it. But at they, the same time, I'll get, I'll I don't give, think Ryan Stark really wants to spend to support that team. No, but, I'll give Cleveland just for how much they surprised me in 2020. And the pitching, the pitching. Their pitching's dynamite. Uh, dynamite. Dynamite. All right, and, <laughs> yeah. And then the AL East, you know, again, pains me to say it. New York Yankees are probably going to win yeah. that division. But then yeah. you have a, a ton of teams for those two wild card spots. Mm-hmm. You know, Blue Jays, Rays, yes. Orioles could be a surprise. Orioles, what? they were close. They were close last year, yeah. Mariners, Angels, you have at least eight teams battling for two to three spots. Rangers the could Angels. make it if everything goes according to plan. I've yeah. said it before and I'll say it again, gentlemen. We are truly in baseball's golden age. Our, you know, our relatives will say, you know, all the players they've gotten to see. But, man, think about the talent in the game of baseball right now. There's a lot less teams that are selling or dumpster fires than there are teams that have yeah. opportunities. And to- unfortunately, unfortunately, I am uh, a fan of one of those dumpster fires. And- hey, we were talking off air about hockey teams. And Dominic and I are fans of two hockey teams that are dumpster fires. So it's okay. You're, you're a Penguins fan. And... 
you know, you redeem you yourself. You can survive on that for a little while. You can chew on that for a little while longer. Mm. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. <laughs> All right, urinating tree. Uh, for anybody who wants to continue to follow your great content, where can they find you? Tell them a little bit about all that. Well, they can find you can find me on uh, urinating tree on YouTube, urinating tree on Twitter. Uh, I have an Instagram, urinating underscore tree, but I don't really do anything on there. So I just shit post. So it's nothing that serious. But it's if you uh, if you want to give it a shot, give it a shot. I I hope it doesn't suck. From wood. Dude, you gotta you gotta do some like just maybe some post game kind of rants on, on your Instagram or something. That's what Todd does with the post game shows here, and he actually just started taking like phone calls. And man, oh man, is that is that a good time? You should really think about doing that. I do a little bit with YouTube Shorts, but it's just like um, eh, just rambling for like a minute. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. Well, your name tree has some great content. Most most of our listeners already know who you are, so. Uh, yeah, there won't be much wonder on, on who you are, but to absolutely check out your name tree. Uh, we'll link all of his stuff down below, including the Artem Reina video that I mentioned. Uh, and on behalf of all of us here at Halos of the Infield and our friends over at Catella Chronicles, make sure to follow them as well. Thank you, everybody, and have a great rest of your day. Absolutely. Take care, guys. Cheers, guys.